every Sunday night. We're continuing our study in Revelation, but on on Sunday night and Wednesday night, I'm I'm adding something uh, different. I am putting in a something about the culture of the first century, so we can better understand the Bible. Now we've talked about how that it, that the world was ruled by the Romans in the first century, and how that they were dictators of all the world and Israel was on the eastern end of the Mediterranean here and they were just a little bitty nation the Lord said I didn't choose you because you were the greatest of the nations you were the smallest of the nations and he said I he said I just chose you uh, by my arbitrary choice and that's election that's predestination and so all the world is worshiping some sun or tree goddess and only Israel is worshiping Jehovah God and they're being ruled by the Roman Empire. Well, Israel has, you have to understand the, the Roman laws, the culture of the day, uh, the idioms, the metaphors, the sayings, the figures of speech. You have to know the character of, of their world, their civilized world, their civil world, their, their civic world, their government, how they ruled, how they allowed the people to rule themselves up to a point. And, uh, you have to understand their vocations. We've been going through some of the vocations of the Jews and their, the Is, Israelite people uh, in the first century. And uh, we've talked about being a carpenter. I'm going to come back on Wednesday night and finish up about uh, the potter. And then uh, we've talked about uh, their uh, vineyards and talked about shepherds. And we've talked about... Uh, uh, they're farming, they're planting, their utensils. And I'm going to read some to you out of this book tonight on Manners and Customs of Bible Lens by Fred White. I like this book because it's very plain words. It's very easy to read. Uh, anyone can read it and understand it. And it will explain some things to you. I'm going to read to you about hunters, how they hunted and uh, how they went out and uh, the methods that they used. Uh, hunters, the first mention of a hunter in the Bible was Nimrod. And we see Nimrod, the first hunter recorded by Scripture. He was called a mighty hunter before the Lord. Look at that in Genesis 10. Look in Genesis 10. He was the first time a hunter was mentioned. And he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. And it doesn't mean that before the Lord doesn't mean that he was there in front of the Lord impressing the Lord. That's not what it means. Uh, I like what Alexander Hislop, Hislop says. When it says before the Lord, he says this has the connotation in the Hebrew of being in front of the Lord against the Lord because he was not only a hunter of animals, he was a hunter of men. and He was the first man to organize cities to attack and overcome other men. Look at Genesis 10, and look here in verse 8. And Cush begat Nimrod, and he began to be a mighty one in the earth, and he was a mighty hunter before the Lord. Wherefore it is said, even as Nimrod, the mighty hunter before the Lord, and the beginning of his kingdom was Babel and Iraq. We get the word Iraq from that. And Yerek, Y-E-A-R-E-A-C-H, Y-E-A-R-A-C-H, Yerak. We get the word Iraq from that, Iraq. And this word, Erek. And our son's name is Eric. And that also comes from that. And Yerak is one of the words for moon, moon. And the moon ruled the seasons, the seasons according to the Psalms. And the moon was there to number the seasons. Uh, so it means ruler, ruler. Uh, and that's what the word Yerak means. And Yerak being moon, moon. And that's what Iraq means. And that's what the uh, derivative of that, our son's name, Eric, means ruler. Uh, Erech, Akkad, Kalna, in the land of Shinar. And we know that Shinar... Shinar is this Mesopotamian valley down here where Babylon was. That's where Babel was built on the Euphrates River. Uh, and then he goes on to say, Out of that land went forth Asher, 
and builded Nineveh in the city of Rehoboth in Calna. Now, I'm not going to go any further than that. Let me get back to just giving you a little bit about hunters. Of Ishmael, it is said that he dwelt in the wilderness and became an archer. In Genesis 21 and 20, Esau was a cunning hunter. Genesis 25 and 27, Isaac said to Esau, Take, I pray thee, thy weapons, thy quiver, and thy bow, and go out to the field, and take me some venison, in Genesis 27 and 3. And if you'll notice, these guys are heroes. They are the mighty men of their day. And the Bible says not many mighty, not many wise in this world, not many noble are called there in 1 Corinthians 1 and 26. Hunting was common in Egypt, and Israel must have been acquainted with it when she dwelt there. There was also, no doubt, some hunting of the Israelites during the wilderness wanderings on the Sinai Peninsula. Upon entering Canaan, it was necessary for Israel to engage in hunting since otherwise their occupation of the land would have been made more difficult. The Lord had said to them, I will not drive them out from before thee in one year, lest the land become desolate and the beast of the field multiply against thee. The law of Moses made provision for hunting for food. And whatever man there be of the children of Israel or of the strangers that sojourn among you, which hunteth and catcheth any beast or fowl that may be eaten, he shall even pour out the blood thereof and cast it with the dust there in Leviticus 17, 13. And I will add in Leviticus 17, 11, the Bible says the life of the flesh is in the blood. And that's a good point. Because whenever they wonder if a baby is alive when it's a fetus in a womb at two days old, if there's any blood there, life is there. And upon the fertilization of the egg, when the sperm fertilizes the egg, the blood factor from the father and the mother is there. So it's alive at two days old. And I don't know how something can grow and not be alive. That's one of the stupidest things I've ever heard in my life. Oh, it's growing, but it's not alive. It's a tree, and since it can't talk or feel or think, it can't be alive. Well, certainly it is. Hunting to protect the sheep. Let me give you a little bit of this. Hunting has been undertaken through the years in Palestine of necessity as a means of protecting the flocks of sheep and goats. And we talked about how, the, the, how that the cougar would devastate a flock and how that bears would come in and destroy the flock. But there was nothing like wolves. Uh, you could take six wolves, five or six wolves. And that's why Paul calls these ravening wolves in the 20th chapter of Acts. He said, when I leave, ravening wolves will come in. And he compares false teachers with ravening wolves. And there in the, the seventh chapter of Matthew, uh, Jesus speaks of these false teachers. They're wolves in sheep's clothing. Well... Most people don't understand what wolves in sheep's clothing means. A false teacher is a wolf in sheep's clothing because all of the prophets were considered to be shepherds and they wore wool coats. That's what it means. They wear the clothes of a shepherd. They wear the clothes of a prophet. But they are wolves. They're ravening wolves. And, of course, uh, uh, Mr. Uh, well, in fact, in this very book here, he tells you about how devastating wolves are, and Mr. Philip Keller, who was a shepherd, tells you that when wolves came into a flock at night and there were a hundred sheep, they weren't satisfied like a bear or a lion with taking one out to eat. They literally came in and killed every sheep in the flock. That's why Paul called them ravening wolves, because they would destroy the entire flock in one night. Now, in Bible times, the chief enemies of the sheep included the lion, the bear, the leopard, the wolf, and the hyena. The shepherd's activities along with these lions have already been dealt with. Animals killed for food. Let me read a little bit about that. Animals killed for food. Among the wild animals, different species of deer were sought after, especially by the Jewish hunters for food. Well... A clean animal has to part the hoof and chew the cud, doesn't it? And a deer chews the cud, doesn't it? And it parts the hoof. So it's not like they can just go out and hunt anything they want to. 
And I might remind you, when the man had, we don't believe in demons here, we believe that self. And when the man of the Gadarenes in Luke the 8th chapter, when the Bible says that, uh, that these people there had some swine nearby, let me remind you, those weren't Jews, because Jews didn't own herds of swine. That was an unclean animal. These were unbelieving sun worshipers. It was venison that Isaac asked Esau to bring to him in Genesis 27.3. The law refers to the roebuck or the gazelle and the heart as being desired by Israel for meat in Deuteronomy 12 and 15. The dinner table of King Solomon was served with the meat of hearts, roebucks, and fallow deer in 1 Kings 4 and 23. Fowl were killed for meat, but it had to be clean fowl. God's wholesale supply of quail for Israel is in the wilderness is indication of the popularity of that kind of meat among ancient hunters. The Arabs today have often captured quantities of this bird, and after much of the meat is consumed, the rest of it is preserved for future use by being split and then laid out for the sun to dry it. This is just what Israel did with its excess supply of quail meat, and they spread them all abroad for themselves round about the camp in Numbers 11 and 32. Doves and pigeons were also popular as food among the Israelites. <coughs> Many of them were, <coughs> were tamed, but wild ones were often sought after for food as well as for sacrificial purposes. If a man was too poor to afford a lamb, he could use a dove. So they sought after that uh, if they didn't have the money. God allowed that in the law. The Bible speaks of their nesting in the clefts and holes of the rocks. In the canticles of the Song of Solomon, the hymn of Solomon, O my dove, thou art in the clefts of the rock. That's what God refers to us as doves. And, of course, he tells us to be wise as serpents and harmless as doves. And that word harmless is the word akarios, A-K-E-R-I-O-S, A-K-E-R-A-I-O-S. And that word means unmixed. Don't have a mixed nature. Don't seek the world. That's in the 10th chapter of Matthew. And seek self at the same time. A double-minded man is unstable in all his ways in James, the first chapter. The methods used by hunters, let me read that. Let me read the methods used by hunters. The methods used by hunters in modern times, the use of the gun is gradually doing away with the ancient customs of hunting with more primitive weapons in Bible lands. But the Bible has given us clear picture of these methods which have been practiced for years. Pitfalls for larger animals. When David said, they have digged mine enemies have digged a pit for me. That's what he's talking about. Pitfalls for larger animals were often employed. These pits were covered over with a thin covering of rushes and brush so as to hide their presence, and sometimes approaches were constructed to the place of the pit, which made it possible to force the animal into the hole. The prophet Ezekiel tells of this method of catching a lion and she brought up one of her whelps. It became a young lion, and it learned to catch the prey. It devoured men. The nations also heard of him. He was taken in their pit in Ezekiel 19 and 3 and 4. Some animals, such as wild bull or antelope, were sometimes taught, caught by using a net. Isaiah mentions this method as a wild bull in a net in Isaiah 51 and 20, and in the 29th Proverbs, I'll add this, uh, Solomon said, the man that flatters you sp spreads a net for your feet. He's trying to catch you like a wild animal. He's trying to catch you in your words. The net used by the Hebrews was probably two varieties. The one was long and had several ropes and was supported on poles that were forked and were of different lengths according to the inequalities of the ground which the net covered. The other type of net was smaller and was utilized in order to stop gaps. When the pitfall or the net was not used, then the hunter made use of one of the following methods. The arrow, sling stones, the spear, or the dart. Remember, 
It was the dart, the little short spear that, uh, uh, that uh, Joab, the nephew of David, his commanding general, killed Absalom with when Absalom hung his hair in a tree. Absalom, when he hung himself by the hair, he didn't hang himself and strangle. He was hanging by his hair and he was hung up and he couldn't get out. And Joab comes along and sees him alive struggling to get out and he throws these darts at him that they would hunt animals with. All these are referred to in the Lord's message to the patriarch Job. The arrow cannot make him flee. The sling stones are turned with him into stubble. And of course, it was the sling that David used to kill, uh, not to kill Goliath, to bring him down. He took his sword and cut off his head. He probably stunned Goliath with a stone. And, uh, and it, it was a, it was a, they had, a, had companies of these slingmen in the tribe of Benjamin. Benjamin was a fighting it was like a young fighting lion, the tribe of Benjamin. And they had all of these guys that had slings. It was a very dangerous weapon. And it was said that they could hit a hair's breadth at like 50 yards. So they, it was a very dangerous weapon. Darts are counted as stubble. He laugheth at the shaking of the spear in Job 41, 28 and 29. That's talking about Leviathan. In catching birds, I'll read the rest of this paragraph and then come back next week. In catching birds, the snare was often used. David was evidently acquainted with bird traps, for he compared his escape from his enemies to the escape of a bird from a trap when he's escaping Saul, when Saul's got thousands chasing him, and he's only got four or five hundred in his army. He says, Our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowlers. The snare is broken, and we are escaped in Psalms 124 and 7. This bird trap was made in two parts and when set and spread upon the ground was fastened slightly by means of a trap stick. The bird trap was by a trap stick. That's a bending of a sapling. It's a bending of a sapling and it had a, huh? Yeah, well, no, no, that's a different thing. This is scandalon, S-K-A-N-D-A-L-O-N, scandalon, and of course the verb is S-K-A-N-D-A-L-I-Z-O. That means to cause to apostatize, cause to apostatize, and that was a trap stick. It was also another synonym for that was called a pogis, P-A-G-I-S. And pogus is actually the snare that comes over. It's a bent sapling. It's a bent sapling, and they snare the animal. And pogus is the word used there in 1 Timothy, the second chapter. When a man desires the office of a bishop, let him not be a novice. We've had so many young preachers come through here and think it's time for them to preach. And uh, it's time for them to be the preacher. And so they go off and start studies and then they get to fuss with me and fuss with the people the bible says you're not to be a novice lest being lifted up in pride you fall into the snare the pogus of the devil and in the thing that traps young men who want to preach too soon is pride that's the snare or the pogus or the scandalizo the scandalon or the scandalizo and that's the word offense you remember, mark them which cause divisions and offenses contrary to the doctrines that ye have learned. That's the word offense. That's the trap stick. So he's, dis so he's talking about this trap stick, how that they trapped animals. That's a word that's used in the Greek language to impart to us what the apostasy is. Of course, apostasize is the word falling away. The day of the Lord will not come except there come a falling away first, away Another word that is a synonym for this is proscoma. Proscoma, it has the same meaning as scandalizo. It means to apostatize. Now, this falling away is, comes from apo and stasis. It means the removal of stasis or removal of standing upright or removal of the cross, the daily cross in our life. So that's the snare of the devil and all through the New Testament, you've got scandalon, scandalizo, proscoma, which is the falling away, and the word pogus, which is the trap stick. That's the exact definition, and pride is what ensnares people when they get involved in trying to 
get too enthusiastic about, well, I think it's time for me to go in full-time ministry. And that's not what we're supposed to be doing. We're supposed to be, it takes a lot of years of studying before we do that. Now, our soul is escaped as a bird out of the snare of the fowler. The snare is broken and we are escaped, Psalms 124, 7. This bird trap was made in two parts and when set and spread over the ground was fastened slightly by means of a trap stick. In fact, when you look up these words in your Strong's Concordance, a lot of times it'll say trap stick. I've done other studies on it. When the bird touched this stick, the parts flew up and enclosed the bird in the net. Now, sometimes they had it in the form of a, a snare on the ground. Sometimes it was a net, but it was the little the sapling that was bent over to catch it. Now, that's all I'm going to read this week. I'm going to get back into Revelation. That's our pre-study. It seems like every time I get into that, I start getting involved in a whole lot of other things that I don't intend to get involved in. We're talking about the book of Revelation. I'm not going to spend a lot of time getting into it. I've got some things to say, and I'm trying to explain to you. Now, the book of Revelation is not what people think it is. It is an explanation of God revealing himself to his saints throughout the book. I believe the book of Revelation, from the way I've studied it and understand it, John said in 96 AD when he wrote this book, he said things that, well, let's read that first verse of the book, first verse of the book, first verse of the book of Revelation, First verse. You know, I see things all the time that I haven't seen before. And I keep, every time I read this book, I read a verse in it. I've read verse 1 a thousand times. I mean, we've been on this book for about 125 weeks for the last two, over two years. And I'm always looking at a verse that I've read over and over and over and over again. And I'm always saying, what is it I have not seen in this verse? And I do that to all the verses I read in the Bible. Because I don't believe God is so shallow that I can understand a verse completely after I've read it a thousand times. Do you believe that? No. And if I actually believe that, that's when you come to a brick wall and you quit learning. I keep saying, where is it? I'm, let me look at it. Wait, look at it from over here. Wait a minute. I think I see something there. And I do, I look at it from over here. I said, let me go over here in Ezekiel and look at it. Wait a minute, let me look at it from over here in Daniel. This is exactly what I do. What, is, what does uh, Jesus say in the Gospels? Wait a minute. Now, this is the way I'm actually looking. I'm, people that can't see me on the audio tapes, but that's the way I look at verses. You understand what I'm saying? I'm scrutinizing them constantly. I don't believe any man understands any given verse of the Bible totally that's ever lived. So sometimes I'll come up and say, man, I've seen something on this. The revelation of Jesus Christ, which God gave unto him to show unto his servants things which must shortly come to pass. Well, John wrote this in 96 A.D. Shortly would be 97 A.D., 98 A.D., 99 A.D., 100 A.D., and so forth to the end of time. Some of it's things that are shortly going to come to pass all the way to the end of time. Just the fact that that phrase, which must shortly come to pass, actually is showing that John is revealing things from his day all the way to the end of time. Revelation, if nothing else... I certainly believe it covers from the beginning to the end. But if nothing else, it at least covers from 96 A.D. to the end of time, doesn't it? Because God's revealing himself, Revelation, A-P-O, K-A-L-U-P-S-I-S, Apocalypsis, we say apocalypse, it comes from apo and calypto. Apocalypto is the word revealed. Apo means off with or removal of the calypto, the cover. It means to remove the cover. And I think of, I think of how, that, how that we were blind, but now we see, and God has removed the scale from our eyes. And the longer we live, the more fiery trials we go through, the more we can see the Word of God. I, that's, I believe that, and I believe that's what Revelation is about. This is a Jewish book that it is about... All of the events of God opening the eyes of the Gentile Israel 
all the way to the end. And some of us, are, some of the church was born back here, and some are born here in the Dark Ages, some in the Middle Ages, and some here during the Reformation, and some up here at the end of time, and some of us are born here. So God is opening the eyes and the ears of all of his elect all through here. Now, I've preached on this for 125 weeks. Uh, if you want to know more about that, you call and request a couple of the old tapes. Now, huh? well, it is. It is a short period of time, yeah, which must shortly come to pass. Well, of course, I believe he's talking about what's going to happen immediately after 96 AD. It is a vapor, and it is revealed to each of us in our lives as we go through the fiery trials. The church is a whole, but the church is not just the people here. The church includes those people that have long died, doesn't it? We understand, but that's not the meaning of this word right here. This, he's, he's saying things that must shortly come to pass. Certainly, our life is a short period of time, and uh, we're going to go through these things in a short period of time because it is a vapor. You don't really realize that till you get older. You think, oh, me, God, wait a minute, I'm little Jimmy Brown. That's what they used to call me in school. That was the other day. Uh, that was, they had all these nicknames for me, and I'm thinking, wait a minute, wait a minute, what, wasn't that two weeks ago that I was 18? No, no, wait a minute, that wasn't what it was. And, you know, when you're young, you look at old people, and you say, I'll never be there, and then all of a sudden you're there. You say, wait a minute, what happened? It was a vapor. And young people don't know that, and I didn't know that. Until it went, it's gone. Now, of course, we're talking about the sevens throughout the book. Seven is the word Sheba in the Hebrew. Sheba. And, of course, Queen of Sheba means Queen of Seven. And then it comes from Shaba, meaning to seven oneself or to take an oath to God. And that takes all the fire that we go through in life. And that's what these sevens are about. And I keep saying this. I believe that that the, that the seven churches of chapter 2 and 3, the seven churches are about, God, God is trying to express to us. He says, this is written to the seven churches. And I use the word seven like an adjective, the sevened church. God sevens us and causes us to take an oath to him throughout our lifetime. And he opens up our eyes and you don't see as much of Christ when you're a baby as you do when you're older. You see a lot of self when you're young. And then your eyes, you have to decrease and Christ has to increase. And then the more he increases, the more our eyes are open to truth. And I see a lot more truth today in my 60s than I did in my 30s. A lot more truth. Now, we've said that you've got sevens all through here. This is the number of refinement, divine refinement. And I believe God's named seven churches. I always read verse 20. When we see the seven churches in verse 4, seven spirits in verse 4, seven churches listed uh, in Asia in verse 11, seven candlesticks in 12 and 13, seven stars in verse 16, and then, of course, in verse 20, the mystery of the seven stars in the right hand of Christ and the seven golden candlesticks, and that's a Jewish thing. Can't tell me that's not Jewish when people say, oh, Revelation is not a Jewish book. Well, what's this seven candlesticks if that's not Jewish? It comes out of the book of, of Exodus where God commanded Moses to make that to be the light, the official light in Israel that was placed in the outer sanctuary. Then he says, the mystery of these seven golden candlesticks and the seven stars in the right hand of Christ, the seven stars... Are the angels of the seven churches? They are the seven angels. We keep saying angel is A G G E L O S, and it means messenger. Messenger. It's the common Greek word for messenger. We are all angels when we take a message of Christ to the world. We're all angels. We're not heavenly creatures. Well, we are in one sense, since Israel is called the heavens, but we're not these beings that supposedly flutter around with wings, but we are messengers. 
Now, you got chapter 2 and chapter 3 that name these churches, and each one of these churches has a problem. I believe these churches depict <coughs> the problem with the church from John until the end of time, and I believe it's a picture of God refining the church, all the deficiencies. I preached on this a while back, but all the deficiencies of the church are listed. I believe all the deficiencies of the church, not just the seven churches, but of the church over all time, the deficiencies, the flaws, the sin in the church is expressed in chapter 2 and 3 and how God has to refine or seven the church. As we said, that word seven comes from the word meaning to be sevened, Shabbat, meaning to take an oath or be sevened or complete. I believe, and I don't believe we can ever really fully see totally all the problems in the church of the Lord Jesus Christ. I pulled out a bunch of them, but I don't believe we can fully see this totally. I don't believe any man will ever totally see it. <coughs> now, let's go back to chapter 2. Chapter 2, we're in the church of Thyatira. It's taken us a long time to get through this because of Jezebel. We've gone back to the Old Testament and read Jezebel, and I'm not going through that anymore. I pretty well covered Jezebel and Ahab and Athaliah, their daughter, and how that Jezebel brought all of this system into, the, into Israel. When she married Ahab, her father was Ethbaal, a priest of Baal, and, uh, and how that uh, she brought this down into Israel, marrying Ahab. She was, she was in Tyre, Tyre and Sidon. And those two words, when I mention Tyre and Sidon together, together the writers tell us, even though there were two cities, they were synonymous. When one was mentioned, the other was implied. So if you say Tyre, Sidon, if he was the priest of Tyre, and if he lived in Sidon, his palace is in Sidon, it's all one and the same. It's what we call Lebanon, just above Israel. That's the old land of Phoenicia in the ancient world. And it's the land of Tyre there in the 16th chapter of 1 Kings where Jezebel comes down, meets Ahab somehow. Of course, he's up there in northern Israel. He's got a palace up there close to Carmel, so he likes that area. And he's right up there. He's associated close to sin or the fire worship. So, uh, so she brings that down into Israel, pollutes the entire system. And we're talking about that in the church of Thyatira. Well, we've gone through Ephesus, who left their first love, their first agape, Agape is one of the words translated love, but agape means to walk in a commandment. They don't walk in the commandments the way they used to. And then uh, we went down to Smyrna. We get the word myrrh from that, and they would anoint dead bodies with myrrh to kill some of the stink. It had a sweet smell. And uh, they had, uh, he said, we have those at Smyrna. They say they're Jews and are not, but are the synagogue of Satan. Of course, the synagogue, if it didn't believe in Jesus Christ, it is of Satan. And back then, they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah and risen from the dead. So anyone that's a true Jew is a Jew of the heart. And he's, the synagogue is within us, or the temple of God is within us. Then we went through Pergamos. Pergamos had a, Pergamos had a couple of specific problems. They... Uh, he, uh, verse 14, I have a few things against thee because thou hast them there that hold the doctrine of Balaam who taught Balak to cast a stumbling block before the children of Israel to eat things sacrificed unto idols and to commit fornication. Now, I'm not going through Balak and Balaam. We went through that in Numbers. Uh, numbers 22, 23, 24, 25. We went through all of that. But the problem was eating sacrifice, eating things sacrificed to idols and to commit fornication. And then we went to Thyatira. And Thyatira is just about 15 miles down the road from Pergamos. And Pergamos was the seat of Satan. That's where the fire worship moved to after Cyrus drove, the, after he conquered Babylon through the Chaldean magician system out of Babylon, it found its seat in Pergamos in the Pergamum Empire, and just down the road is the city of Thyatira, and these are all places where that 
Paul would go and preach. John would go and preach. And they had synagogues there. The reason that Paul would go to a synagogue was that came out of Babylon. That was the method of worship in Babylon. And that's how they organized in Babylon because when they were carried into captivity, the Jews were carried into captivity. They couldn't have temple worship in Babylon, so they organized synagogues. And then they were scattered all over the world when Babylonian king Nebuchadnezzar scattered them. So therefore, when Paul went to preach into one of these Gentile lands, he would preach in the synagogues because he could catch all the Jews there on the Sabbath, on what we call Friday evening to Saturday evening. He could catch them there, and they did not believe that Jesus was the Messiah, and that's why they were always trying to kill Paul because he's going into their synagogues and preaching the resurrected Christ to them, and they're going, hey, we'll kill this guy. They kept trying to do that when he went to Galatia there in 13, 14 chapter of... uh, of Acts. And then he says in verse 20, he tells him in verse 19, Thyra, Tyra, I know thy works, thy charity, thy service, the faith, thy patience, thy works, and the last to be more than the first. I know that you are working harder now in the truth than you were at the first, but you got one problem. Notwithstanding, I have a few things against thee because thou sufferest that woman Jezebel which calleth herself a prophetess to teach. You're allowing, and that's not a new Jezebel or a woman named Jezebel. We've already gone through that. It's the Jezebel of the Old Testament Scriptures. And I'm not going to go into that other than just to say, Israel never repented of their fire and tree worship. So when their synagogues scattered throughout the world, they're still involved in this fire and tree worship, even though they say they aren't, because fire and tree worship is self-worship. And they have interpreted the word of God there in, uh, when they're in these synagogues. They've, of course, the great synagogue of Babylon had a, had a uh, rabbi, a chief rabbi that would add his verbal comments, pass that down as holy. And that was the Halakot, I don't have time to get into. And they had the Haggadah, which was the written commentaries. And they twisted the word of God. They had a self doctrine. And he says, she has seduced to teach and seduce my servants to commit fornication and to eat things sacrificed unto idols. Now, I've gone through that. I'm not going to go through that again, other than just to say, commit fornication. I'll, I'll just say this quickly. Commit fornication and eat things sacrificed to idols. Sacrificed. Two idols. When you couple those two together, that had to do with going to a pagan temple, pagan temple in the ancient world, and to eat their sacrifice to idols along with participating in their sexual promiscuity worship where they had all of these temple prostitutes. They had a thousand temple prostitutes at the temple of Aphrodite there in Greece. So... When you see these two together, this is not the same thing. This is what, in Acts 15, I will just say this. I said it when, in Acts the 15th chapter, if you look over there real quick like, Acts 15. <coughs> in Acts 15. And you really need to see this, just at least this much. I'm going to try not to spend time on it. But Acts 13 and 14. Acts 13 and 14. Paul goes to Galatia to preach. And that is that is up here right in the center of Turkey. He goes to Galatia. He goes to Antioch. Iconium, Lystra, and Derby. Antioch, Iconium, Lystra. These are cities in Galatia. Derby. And of course, he goes to synagogues there. And when he comes back <coughs> off of this trip, which probably took several years, he comes back to Jerusalem. And some of the Judaizers uh, go to Paul. He's up here in Caesarea in Syria. And they say, you need to go back and circumcise those Gentiles 
those Gentile believers in those synagogues. And Paul says, no, I'm not going to do that. And, I, and, and to make a long story short, he says, I'm not going to do that. Let's go back to the council at Jerusalem and see what they've got to say. And, uh, of course, one of the men, the first men that stands up, and the whole purpose of this is you have these Judaizers thinking you've got to keep the rituals of the Jews. They're believers. They're believers, but they think we've got to go circumcise these Gentiles up here to keep them from being persecuted, going to the synagogues. Paul said, no, let's don't do that. And Peter stands up. This is the council at Jerusalem in Acts 15. Acts 15 is like a uh, focal point in, in the book of Acts. It points to the council at Jerusalem that's headed up by James, the brother of Jesus. Well, Peter stands up, verse 7, And when there had been much disputing, Peter rose up and said unto them, Men and brethren, you know that how a good while ago God made choice among us, among all the apostles, that the Gentiles by my mouth should hear the word of the gospel and believe. That's a reference to Acts 10. When Peter went to the house of Cornelius, he didn't want to go to the house of Cornelius. And God dropped the sheet out of heaven and said, kill and eat of all these clean and unclean animals. And Peter said, I have never eaten anything common or unclean. God said, don't you call common or unclean what I have cleansed. And this is a reference to Leviticus 11, the dietary law, and it's fulfilled in going to the Gentiles, because God said, Peter said, I haven't eaten anything common or unclean. And God said, don't you call common or unclean what I have cleansed. Go to the Gentiles and preach. So the shadow in the Old Testament, Leviticus 11, the unclean foods are fulfilled in going to the Gentiles. What was called unclean, and if you go to the fourth chapter of 1 uh, Timothy, the scripture says, all things are being received, received with thanksgiving. Now, it's not healthy for you to eat uh, pork, but ham sure is good. But it's not healthy. It'll give you a heart attack sooner. You'll die younger. But, it's, but we do not keep the ritual of the law now. It's fulfilled in the Gentile and Peter going to the Gentiles. When he said, it was by my mouth that they first heard the gospel and believed. And God, which knoweth the hearts, bear them witness, giving them the Holy Ghost, even as he did unto us, and put no difference between us, the Jew, and them, Gentiles, purifying their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, Peter says, this is Peter talking, at the council, James is present, the apostles are present, Paul's present, Barnabas is present. And Peter is standing up, saying, Now, therefore, why tempt ye God to put a yoke upon the neck of the Gentiles, this circumcision, which neither our fathers nor we were able to bear? They didn't even keep the law. Paul says that over in Galatians, the sixth chapter. But we believe that through the grace of the Lord Jesus Christ, we shall be saved even as they. Then all the multitude kept silence and gave audience to Barnabas and Paul, declaring what miracles and wonders God had wrought among the Gentiles by them in Acts 13 and 14 when they went to these cities. And, of course, they tried to kill Paul. At, at, uh, at The people at Antioch drove him out. And then they tried to uh, kill him at Iconium. They chased him down to Lystra. It took him about three or four weeks to get him down to Lystra. They took him outside the city, stoned him, and left him for dead outside of Lystra. And then he went down to Derby. And then he came back to Lystra, back to Iconium, back to Antioch. He was a glutton for punishment. Either that or he believed God. And after they had held their peace, James answered. Now, James, the brother of Jesus, is head of the council at Jerusalem, I didn't mean to get in this, but I'll go ahead and do it. Men and brethren, hearken unto me. Simeon hath declared, or Simon, Peter, he's, Simeon refers to Peter, Simon, hath declared how God at first did visit the Gentiles to take out of them a people for his name. Of course, that is the elect Gentiles up there in Galatia. And that's why Paul wrote the letter to Galatia. If you're going to study Galatians, you've got to study Acts 13 and 14 first. Because that is Galatia. Antioch, Iconium, Derby, and Lystra. And to this agree the words of the prophets as it is written. After this, I will return and will build again the tabernacle of David, which has fallen down, and will build again the ruins thereof, and will set it up that the residue of men might seek after the Lord 
And all the Gentiles upon whom my name is called, saith the Lord, who doeth all these things, known unto God are all his works from the beginning of the world. He knows the Gentiles that he will call. He knows the works he wants them to do. But if they go back circumcising in the name of Judaism, what else are these Gentiles going to have to do? All All the law. That's right. All the law. And Peter and Paul are saying, no, sirree, not on your life. We are not going to impose the law. The ritual is the law. Besides that, Paul says in Colossians 2.14, the handwriting of ordinances were nailed to the cross with Christ. The rituals were nailed to the cross. Everything is now spiritual. Circumcision is spiritual. That was the first prerequisite to being a Jew in Israel. Circumcision on the eighth day after birth. If you came into Israel as a proselyte, The males had to be circumcised immediately. Wherefore, this is James talking, my sentence is. The word sentence is krino. Judge. This is James talking. He says, here's what we need to do. Now, this is James saying, we need to make a compromise. If If you send back up here, If you send emissaries up here to circumcise these people, then you're telling them they're going to have to keep all the law. Well, you got synagogues ruling, and the Romans would allow synagogues to rule all the people within their precincts. So when they allowed them to rule all the people within their precincts and the people who came to the synagogue, the the Gentiles are going to have to have a way of compromising (laughs) And recognizing the laws of the synagogue without getting involved in the rituals of the law themselves. And I believe what Hendrickson's, uh, uh, what Hendrickson's uh, uh, commentary says, James issues a compromise. He says, what we will do, we will have the Gentiles do something up here that will show the Jews in particular synagogues will have them do four things so that we, they will understand out of the Jewish law to make a compromise. It will recognize that synagogue as sovereign in its work, but by the same token, it will tell them, you have to recognize us. It's going to be a compromise on both parts. The synagogue saying, okay, if you'll do these four things that James has suggested, it's a compromise on both parts and giving credibility to both sides. So here's what James says. Here is my sentence. This was a hard thing to deal with in the first century. Extremely difficult. So James says, here's my sentence. That we trouble not them which from among the Gentiles are turned to God. What is he talking about? Trouble. He's talking about, let's don't... uh, The word is paranocleo. P-A-R-E-N-O. P-A-R, I don't want to start to write there. P-A-R-E, P-R-E, N-O-C-H-L-E-O, N-O, C-H-L-E-O. The word means to harass. Let's don't harass them by saying, you got to take, you got to uh, be circumcised. Now you got to start taking the law. But that we write unto them, let's write a statement unto them of compromise. That we write unto them that they abstain from pollutions of idols... And from fornication. There's those words to Pergamos. Aren't they? There's those words to Thyatira. What they're saying here. He's not simply saying. Stay away from fornicating. And stay away from going to one of their temples. He is saying that. But he's saying. Disassociate with idolatry. And serve the Jehovah living God. That's what he's saying. He's saying the same words. Basic same words, it is a compromise that they're making. And from fornication, and from things strangled, which was in the Jewish law, and from blood. This is not giving the Gentiles a dietary law. It's not what it's doing. Picking out four things, particularly abstaining from pollutions of idols and fornication. When those two are named together, those two are named in a sense to say, stay away from idolatry. 
So what they're doing is showing a compromise that they will do. And when they do this, they're going to be recognizing, they're going to be recognizing the authority of the synagogue there. And when the synagogue accepts this, they're going to be recognizing the compromise and the Gentiles are going to be saying, we recognize you. And they're going to be saying, we recognize you. And you won't have to get involved in all the laws of the synagogue. It was a compromise. Now, that's what Hendrickson says. Uh, let me see if I got that, if I can find it quickly. All right. Well, I don't want to read all this. He says, I judge. Let me read out of Hendrickson's. The ca- in the council, all eyes are fixed on James, who serves as the chairman. Everyone expects him to set forth a ruling to which they can agree. James then summarizes the proceedings of the council and states emphatically, I judge. He, as their leader, gives his audience and concise recommendation. Do not trouble these Gentiles who are turning to God. Don't tell the Gentiles they've got to partake in ritual, crackers and grape juice, dipping people in water. The Greek verb that I have translated trouble actually means crowd in on someone. Don't push them. Don't be pushy. This is exactly what the Judaizers are doing to the Gentile believers. They crowd into the lives of the Gentiles by demanding circumcision and the observance of the Mosaic law. That's what they were trying to get them to do. Here we're in Christianity. Let's keep the Mosaic law. That's what the Worldwide Church of God does. That's what the uh, Seventh-day Adventist does. No, let's don't do that, he says. The rituals were nailed to the cross. Yes, we believe in the law, but it's spiritual now. James refrains from mentioning circumcision and obedience to the law, but he employs language that says, stop crowding in on these people. The Jewish Christians ought to rejoice that the Gentiles are turning to God. The text indicates that Gentile conversions are common. James knows, James is the brother of Jesus, he knows that the Judaizers will not be satisfied with a negative exhortation, just coming up and saying, no, we're not going to do it, that's the end of it. So they make a compromise. Hence, he suggests, we're not talking about compromising the word of God, we're talking about it's the same thing, if you're going to go out, don't cast a stumbling block for someone. It's like that first part of the 14th chapter of of Romans, there's a polarized situation where you had two different poles. You had the Gentiles over here, Gentile believers over here, Jewish believers over here. And, they're, and the Jewish believers are saying, oh, you've got to keep the rituals of the law. And Paul is saying, no, don't do that. And the Jewish believers are saying, we're a little better than you. And Paul is saying, no, you're not. All men are the same. All, there's none good, not one. None seeks after God. So he says, if someone comes into the church... And they're weak, have a weak conscience. They're in the 14th chapter of Romans. With this polarized situation and they're Jews thinking they have to keep the rituals of the law. And they're keeping certain dietary laws. He said, receive them without disputation. Don't dispute with them. If someone comes to the church and is weak, just because they're baby sheep, don't kick them around and beat them. Because they don't understand the scripture yet. It's not what we're supposed to be doing. And if you've got a friend who's a believer, and he's a Jew, and you know he's trying to practice rituals of Judaism, or maybe he calls himself a Messianic Jew, and you're going to go out to eat with him, you don't go out and sit down in a restaurant and say, hey, bring me ham and eggs. Bring him a pork chop. Even though he's weak and he doesn't know that he doesn't have to participate in that, You're not compromising the word of God. That's exactly what James is saying here. We have to be very compassionate to weak baby sheep. I said that Wednesday night, don't we? Hence, he suggests four recommendations that are applicable to Gentile Christians who associate with Jewish Christians. That's Mr. Hendrickson's right here. Especially those who live in the dispersion, which we're talking about. In these synagogues that were organized in Babylon. He seeks to promote unity among believers of both Jewish and Gentile backgrounds. James wants the Christians to live together in wholesome relationship, whether they're Jew or Gentile. But he doesn't want to impose, Peter said, we're not going to impose upon the Gentiles. 
this rituals, even that they were keeping themselves as a, as a probably as a, as a position of national unity, not because they had to do it. He desires that they observe certain prescribed rules which re- preclude, preclude any offense rising from table fellowship or social contacts when they go to sit down and eat with somebody. James proposes that the council write a letter to the Gentile Christians and tell them what they must do. Polluted food. In our present day societal structures, the first stipulation is almost unintelligible. But for Gentile believers during the middle of the first century, we wouldn't understand it, but in the first century, every word in the command from to abstain from things polluted by idols was meaningful. From two other places where the stipulation is repeated, we learn that food, expressly meat, was sacrificed to idols. Look that in Acts. In Acts. Wait a minute, not in Acts. Now look at verse twenty-nine. Look at verse twenty-nine. Verse twenty-nine. That you abstain from meats offered to idols, and from blood, and from things strangled, and from fornication. From which, if you keep yourselves, you shall do well. Fare ye well. Now, let me finish reading this. Jews compared... Wait a minute. Let me give you 21. Let me give you chapter 21. Chapter 21. (coughs) Chapter 21. All right. Now, Paul uh, is going to Jerusalem... To be taken, and uh, he's being accused of things that he hasn't done. And he says, and uh, let me see, where do I need to start? Uh, now, let me just back up here. Verse 18, the day following, Paul went in with us unto James, and all the elders were present. And when he had saluted them, he declared particularly what things God had wrought among the Gentiles by his ministry, still in reference to all the things that he had preached. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord and said unto him, Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are all zealous of the law. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not to circumcise their children neither to walk after the customs. What is it? <coughs> Hold on a second. <coughs> They're accusing him. Let me read that again. The Jews are accusing him. Back up to verse 20. Thou seest, brother, how many thousands of Jews there are which believe, and they are zealous of the law. Let me read it slower. And they are informed of thee that thou teachest all the Jews which are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses. No, he didn't. He's saying, don't put this on the Gentiles. And he's being accused of something that he hadn't done. I've been accused of things. Saying they ought not to circumcise their children. Telling that He's not telling the Jews that, is he? He's saying, don't do this to the Gentiles. Neither to walk after the customs or after the rituals of the law. No, he's not. He's not saying that to the Jews. He's saying don't do it to the Gentiles. What is it, what is it therefore? The multitude must needs come together, for they will hear that thou art come. Do therefore this that we say to thee, we have four men which have a vow on them. Them take and purify thyself with them, and be at charges with them that they may shave their heads And all may know that these things whereof they were informed concerning thee are nothing, but that thou thyself also walkest orderly and keepest the law. As touching the Gentiles which believe, we have written and concluded that they observe no such thing, save only that they keep themselves from things offered to idols and from blood and from strangled and from fornication, and that's all. And we didn't tell it to the Jews. Paul's being lied about just like Jesus was, isn't he? All right, let's go back over here. Let's, let, me, let me finish reading this to you. All right. 
The Jews compared meat sacrifice to an idol. Let me read this slow. Jews compared, compared meat sacrifice to an idol with a corpse. They considered meat that was offered to idols, the Jews did. It was offered to an idol, they considered it a corpse. You're eating a dead body. Anyone touching a corpse was considered defiled. Consequently, no Jew ate polluted meat. So therefore, when they say they're not going to eat meat offered to idols, they're not going to be eating a corpse or a dead body. So this is a, this is a good point of sacrifice on the part of these Gentile converts say, okay, we won't eat dead bodies because we know that's against the law. They're going to take four points of the law and follow them. Further, Jewish and Gentile Christians regarded partaking of food sacrificed to idols as tantamount to showing allegiance to a pagan deity. That's what we've been talking about. Gentiles who had embraced the Christian faith, for example, in Corinth, had repeatedly observed the sacrificial rituals at the temples of the numerous pagan gods. These people now pledged their allegiance to Jesus Christ by disavowing their pagan heritage and shunning all forms of idolatry. Sexual immorality, number two, fornication. Gentile believers knew that at pagan temple rituals, sexual immorality was the order of the day with their prostitutes, or with the women that came to the temple. So, when they're setting up these four points, these are some crucial points where they're agreeing with the Jews, but they're not going to take on the whole law. From Paul's epistles, we learn that Gentile Christians needed repeated reminders to flee from sexual immorality. John Calvin thinks that the apostolic stipulation to avoid living a sexually immoral life referred to pagan practice of keeping a common law wife. Now, number three, strangled animals. Keep yourself from strangled animals. A Jew refuses to eat the meat of an animal that has been strangled. Whenever an animal is not butchered and its blood properly drained from the body, the meat is defiled. What do they call that if it's properly drained? Kosher. That's kosher. And it has to be properly drained. Otherwise, it's against Jewish law. So keep things strangled. It's not properly bled. And when you find a deer out in the woods that is dead or been hit by a car, it's not properly bled. You're not thinking about eating it, are you? It's really not healthy, is it? Aren't you supposed to drain it correctly? Bleed it right? I'm talking about for health reasons. If it's not too old. <laughs> Probably when it gets really down to it, if you went to some people that knew about, about draining blood, God wouldn't have put that in the Bible if it really wasn't more healthy for us to drain the blood properly. It's the hormones from diet. The yeah. Freaking out. Like yeah. Hormones yeah. Okay, this animal then is a cadaver unfit for human consumption. The apostolic injunction to Gentile believers not to eat any meat of strangled animals teaches them basic sanitation. Compliance with the injunction gives them social acceptability among Jewish believers in the Christian community. It gives them social acceptability. Blood, the, the fourth thing. This last stipulation concerns the Jewish abhorrence of blood... The Mosaic law forbids consumption of blood and states that life is in the blood in Genesis 9, 4, Leviticus 3, 17, 7, 26, 17, 10, and 13 through 14. Gentile Christians were fully aware of the Jewish religious, moral, and dietary restrictions. Hence, the apostolic decrees were not a shock to them. The four stipulations formulated by James would not be a burden to the Gentile believers, even though they were presented in a negative form to abstain from. At the same time, their Jewish friends would approve their willingness 
to observe these four stipulations. In short, as leader of the Jerusalem Council, James suggests a course of action that would not hinder the Gentiles longing for salvation by God with a demand for circumcision and a strict observance of the Levitical law. They don't want to put that on them. And where they're not supposed to. We talk, we talk about that when we talk about the rituals nailed to the cross, don't we? The suggested course also would satisfy Jewish Christians who call for adherence to the law. Do y'all realize how complex this was in the first century? It was a complex situation. It doesn't seem to be complex to us. But they had synagogues, and the Romans were allowing those synagogue teachers, if the majority of that city was ruled, was Jewish inhabitants, they allowed the civic law to extend from the, from the uh, Jewish synagogues out to the borders of that county or whatever, that the precincts there. Some courts in the temple were closed to Gentiles, but aside from this limitation, Jewish and Gentile Christians were mingling freely since Peter's visit to Cornelius in Caesarea. The recommendation of James then, when James says, here is my decision, constitutes a plea to both Jewish and Gentile believers to accept one another and promote the unity of the Christian church regardless of the differences. We're not talking about difference in predestination versus free will belief. We're talking to people who believe in certain minor things. Well, I got to eat this. I can't eat that. I've had people come in here and say, well, we're not supposed to eat unclean food. And I'll say, well, that's been nailed to the cross. Now, as, as you grow, uh, I would, I'm going to be eating some ham and bacon and, and you don't have to eat it. But I'm not going to tell the church that they have to. Go. And I've had people come here insisting on me telling the church, well, we've got to keep the, uh, we can't eat unclean food. We can't eat, uh, if you start in on unclean food, that's everything in America. <laughs> That's everything at Kroger's. All the steroids and everything. James attempts to appease both parties. As the rest of this chapter reveals, he succeeds in doing so. And then when he says, For Moses has been preached in every city, in verse 21, since the days of old, and is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. What is James? What, I'm going to read this, and then I'm going to get on with the lesson. No, gosh, I'm going to probably end up doing more this night, figured. Now, I meant to bring this out a long time ago. For Moses has been preached in every city since days of old, and is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. What James is trying to say with these words, we're talking about in Acts 17. Paul is out on the road in Acts 13 and 14, in Acts 7, 15, in Acts 15, that is the Jerusalem Council. Council. All the apostles are there. Paul's there. Barnabas is there. Peter's there. Man, can you? What a gathering. Man, alive. It's a good thing somebody didn't have the bomb that they blow up the, where they were all. That was the get. That is a gathering, and what they're doing in James, the brother of Jesus, is the head of the council. So he's taking the floor. What James is trying to say with these words that that conclude his address is he speaking to the Jews or to the Gentiles? Is he pleasing the Judaizers who demand the Gentile believers circumcision and adherence to the Mosaic law? Well, that's what they said. I didn't read it. When Paul comes in on his missionary journey in verse 28, we start of chapter 14. You go to chapter 15, verse 1. Certain men came down from Judea, taught the brethren, and said, Except you be circumcised after the manner of Moses, you cannot be saved. Of course, verse 2, When therefore Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and disputation with them, they determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain others of them should go up to Jerusalem under the apostles and elders about this question. Paul's saying, I'm not doing it. Peter says, no, let's don't do it. And James says, no. Gosh, what greater authority can you have than Peter and Paul and Mary? I don't know, Peter, Paul, and, J and James. <laughs> yeah. Is he divesting the Gentiles of the freedom that they have just received? And what he's trying to tell us 
is to be patient with weak believers. And he's talking about Jews in the synagogue that were believers that were continuing the rituals of the law and their circumcision. Well, that's a hard place to understand. When we withdraw from people who are walking disorderly, it doesn't mean somebody comes to the church and they're trying to wear a yarmulke, a little, little beanie on their head. Or it don't mean if he says, I'm a Messianic Jew and he don't understand certain things, don't jump all over him and chew him out. He just walked in the door. He just got here. He's just a visitor. And it doesn't mean he's an unbeliever. If he believes in predestination, the sovereignty of God, and he understands some things about death to self and daily cross, there are basics in the gospel. But it doesn't mean everybody that's supposed to understand Christmas is pagan and Easter is pagan, and, and baptism is blood, not water, and, and uh, communion is, not, is Passover, it's spiritual Passover, not crackers and grape juice. It doesn't mean somebody, I've got a high regard for certain men in the intellectual community, particularly Gleason Archer. I think he's a tremendous teacher. He, he's part, one of the writers of the Theological Word Book of the Old Testament. And he's got a survey of, of, uh, of the Old Testament. And man, the guy is brilliant. But I, but I doubt seriously, seriously, since he was tied to a denomination that he gave up his water baptism and he gave up his uh, crackers and grape juice. It doesn't mean I'm going to accept that. And, and uh, I doubt seriously if he f- gave up his Christ Mass. But I know he believed in predestination and daily cross and death to self. And those are the prerequisites. Not that I'm going to accept somebody coming in here preaching this around. If somebody comes up and preaches something that I don't teach and that we don't believe here, I'll go to them and say, uh, we don't believe that here. If you want to keep coming, that's fine. You can disagree with me. But don't preach it behind the scenes and behind my back and go back here. Now, I've had people do that, go outside and preach this. And I'll be patient with them, and they can come as long as they want. And I feel like in time, and a lot of people have come here and begin to see things over a long period of time. I've had people say, well, I didn't agree with you when I first come, especially that baptism thing. Boy, that hit me so hard. And I couldn't, I couldn't have my water dipping in water anymore. But I listened to you for two years, and then I started getting it. But I have to be patient with people like that. I don't mind somebody disagreeing. I do mind somebody undermining what I'm teaching when I feel like I've taught longer and studied longer than they have and I understand it better than they do. Don't mind a, a person disagreeing. That's, that's okay. But don't undermine the ministry. And that's all he's saying here. Be patient with these people. Is, huh? Well, we don't know exactly, but we know that he said to Corinth in 1 Corinthians, he said, I washed some of you in the house of uh, Stephanus and, uh, and uh, Crispus and Gaius, but I'd, Christ didn't send me to do that. Let's stop doing it. We don't know exactly when. Just because Jesus was nailed to the cross in Colossians 2.14, the Bible says that when he was nailed to that cross, it doesn't mean all the Jews said, okay, let's quit. It took a long time to bleed that ritual out of their lives. And even Paul kept doing it. Paul was rushing back to Jerusalem. Look at it quick there. Well, but Mary, uh, Paul kept baptizing people all along the way up to a point. He's not at Corinth here. And he stops at a place. He comes to a place where he quits. This is proselyte baptism. I don't want to go into that right now. Let's don't go into that right now. It, I will be all night long just on baptism. It will take me to 2 o'clock in the morning. I don't want to go there. Huh? She was a proselyte. She sure was. All right. Look here. I was going to show you something. I lost my place now. Huh? No. I can't remember what it was. Let me finish reading this. Mary got me off the subject. Don't do that. Is he divesting the Gentiles of the freedom they have just received? Is he divesting the Gentiles of this freedom in the Lord that they've received? No. We could ask additional questions and find answers to each of them, but the fact remains that this particular verse is difficult to interpret. James begins by saying, 
We're talking about verse 21. Moses was preached in every synagogue since days of old and is read every Sabbath in the synagogues, which were Babylonian in origin. James begins by saying, for Moses has been preached in every city since days of old. The conjunction for introduces the reason for the four stipulations. Back up there and look at that. Go back to verse 20. That we write to to them, this is chapter 15, that they abstain from pollutions of idols and from fornication and from things strangled and from blood for. That word for connects, it's a conjunction introducing the reason for the four stipulations, isn't it? For. Moses of old time hath in every city them that preach him being read in the synagogues every Sabbath day. Let me read this, the explanation of Mr. Hendrickson out of his commentary. The conjunction for introduces the reason for the four stipulations. That is, the Jewish Christians could require additional demands, but James looks at the reality of the situation and points to the dispersion of the Jews. After the exile, probably in the time of Ezra, We talked about this morning. Synagogues were built so that people could receive religious instruction in the law of Moses when they're over here in Babylon. During the time of Ezra, synagogues were built because they don't have the temple in Jerusalem because they're scattered over the face of the earth and they're in Babylon. They don't have a way to worship. So the synagogue is introduced in the time of Ezra. In every city, in every city throughout the known world of that day, the Jewish people acquainted the Gentile population with the teaching of God's word. Gentiles who received instruction were called, this is good, I like this. Gentiles in this century that received instruction were called God-fearers. That's what Gentiles were called. Like that. People say, we're not supposed to fear. When, when Paul told Timothy in 2 Timothy, that first chapter, God hasn't given the spirit of fear, but power and of love and a sound mind. The word fear there is D-E-L-E-I-A. That word delia means timid. And Paul is telling Timothy, stir up the gift that's in you and go preach to men. God hasn't made you timid towards men doesn't mean you're not supposed to fear God. We're to fear him that can destroy both soul and body in hell. And Moses is read every Sabbath in the synagogues. James argues here at, in Acts 15 that these Gentiles are not unfamiliar with the Mosaic precepts. It's not like they're stupid. They know what the Mosaic law is and the rituals. Should they wish to know more about these precepts, They are able to hear them explained once a week in all the synagogues. Accordingly, James is addressing the Judaizers. They are Christians. They're believers. They haven't been able to give up their rituals, their Levitical laws. They're weak believers. You see that? Just being a weak believer doesn't mean we're supposed to condemn them. He's not saying compromise the word of God. Compromise your temper and how much you think you know. To learn how to deal with baby believers. You don't take a baby and kick it around and say, hey, hey, get up, get out of bed, go to work. You're already five weeks old. Get a job. You don't do that, do you? And you don't do that to baby believers. And you don't do that to any believers, beating them up. That's what James is bringing out. James is addressing the Judaizers who do not wish to hinder the evangelistic task of the Jews who are living in the dispersion. Even these Judaizers are believers and they got a a tender heart for the Lord. But they're caught up in ritual. These are not unbelievers that James is talking to. He's talking to weak believers, but he also faces the Gentile Christians and implicitly tells them to respect the Jews 
who observe the Mosaic ordinances. I wrote something down here. The four suggestions are a sign of the respect for the law observed by the Jews. It is concession that Jewish communities who have their civil law ruling the religious law that these Gentiles are respecting Jews by observing and being harmless. In brief, James appeases both Jews and Gentiles with his concluding remarks and consequently preserves the unity of the church. Can you see that? It's the same thing. Look at Romans 14. I don't know how we got here. But it's the same thing in Romans 14. In Romans 14, you had the same polarized situation going on at Rome. You had a bunch of Jewish believers thinking that they were better than the Gentile believers because they were Jews. And they were lifting themselves up. And when Paul says there's none righteous, no, not one, he's talking about between Jew and Gentile. But look here in Romans we see there's a weakness going on in the church, and we're talking about things sacrificed to idols and committing fornication. Romans 14. Him that is weak in the faith, verse 1, he's weak. He's a baby. Receive ye. But not to, not to doubtful disputations. Don't doubt and dispute with him about whether he's a believer or not. If he's weak and he doesn't understand everything that Jim Brown says, the first Sunday he comes or the second Sunday or the first month, or the second, you've been coming here six months, you ought, to, you ought to believe what we believe. We have people that believe a lot of different things that are associated with the ministry, and that's okay. And when somebody says, I don't think I necessarily agree with what you're saying, I've learned to take that in consideration, and I don't even believe they mean what they're saying when they say that. I believe what they mean, they're saying I don't understand these things you're saying. I've never heard these before. That's, and I've said that to some people that will talk to me right here in the church. They'll say, I don't agree with everything you're saying. I said, do you think it could be maybe you don't understand why I'm saying it? And I've had some of them kind of drop their head and go, yeah, I don't understand it. So it doesn't mean something because somebody under, doesn't understand. And when they say, I don't agree with all that you're saying, that's still some sin in them. That's a lot of self in them. It doesn't mean we're supposed to, well, I'm going to cut off fellowship with you because you don't believe the truth. Well, give them a chance to grow up. Give these Judaizers a chance to grow up. They are believers, aren't they? And that's what Paul is saying right here in Romans 14. Him that is weak in the faith. They're weak, but they are in the faith, aren't they? They have little faith. It hasn't grown. Don't beat them up. Receive ye. We're not talking about him that's weak in the faith and believes in free will. No, we're not talking about that. And he goes on to tell you what weak in the faith is. For one believeth that he may eat all things. Another who is weak eateth only herbs and he's trying to go by the Levitical law. And he's, some of them are even worse than Levitical law. They won't eat nothing. They won't eat any kind of meat whatsoever. He said, receive them without doubtful disputations. Don't dispute with them. Let not him that eateth despise him that eateth not. And let not him that which eateth not judge him that eateth. He's saying whenever you've got a difference, not in major doctrines, not in the sovereignty of God. We're not talking about that. We're not talking about somebody who believes they can accept Christ and walk to the aisle and pray the sinner's prayer. No, don't accept that. We're talking about people who are misinterpreting certain things in Scripture. They're babies. That's what he's talking about here. For God hath received him. Well, if God really loves him, God would tell him all the truth right now. Oh, he would. Did I learn all the truth all at once? And I ain't learned it yet. And everything I know and everything I teach about the Bible, I've been deprogramming since that I learned in my father's Baptist church. I've been throwing out garbage. I've been garbaging out for... 45 or 50 years. Well, don't send them to them. Don't judge them. That don't mean nothing. That's not ours to say, whether they're hearing or not. And I don't, we've had a lot of people leave here. Yeah, but they want to continue to 
if they want to fellowship and not listen to the tape, that's their business. Well, but Mary, you're talking about somebody that's being rebellious. That's what you're talking about. You're talking about a specific person that's giving us a hard time on our theology. She's disagreeing with us. We're not talking about that. We're talking about a disagreement on major points of theology. That's not what we're talking about. Somebody who wants to fight. If somebody wants to come here and fight me, we're not, I'm, I'm supposed to be patient with them, and they're supposed to be patient with me. But we're not supposed to be hard on one another. If somebody comes in here and I'm going to be patient with them and they want to keep beating me up on my theology, no, back off. I'm not going to, I'm not going to let somebody come and beat me up, walk down here in the front every time I preach. And after I preach, come down here, look, I don't like you said this and you said that and I don't like this. No, absolutely not. Because first of all, they're not supposed to come in here be giving me a hard time. I won't give them a hard time. I've had people sit right there in the back and give me a hard time during the message and argue with me during the message. Well, I won't have that. We've had a lot of people come here that disagreed with things I said. There's people that come here who are dear friends, and I've gotten the message, well, he don't believe it all that you say. That's okay. He doesn't give me a hard time either. It doesn't have to believe everything I say. First of all, you can't believe everything the algebra teacher says. If you go take a class from Mike, you can't believe everything he says uh, all at once because he ain't going to say it to you all at once. You can't learn everything there is to learn about something all at once. I could say, Mike, I just don't know if I believe that. I could say that or I could say, Mike, I don't think I understand that. Because I don't understand it doesn't mean I can't believe it. So what he's saying here, let's be patient. Then he says, Who art thou that judgest another man's servant? To his own master he standeth or falleth. And God is his master. Yea, he shall be holding up, for God is able to make him stand. If somebody comes here and they don't understand Christmas is pagan, they can keep coming not believing Christmas is pagan as long as they don't start a ruckus here. But God is going to do the work. That's right. It'll be God. People say, Would you let a prostitute? I'd fill up the front row with prostitutes in and homosexuals. If they sit here and listen to what I'm preaching without converting, they can't. They'll have to get up and leave or change. I'm not going to sit here and say nobody can come here. Anybody can come here that wants to, but people can't come here and make trouble for me because I'm teaching what I believe is truth. I'll be patient with them. They be patient with me, but when people start yelling at me from the audience, we don't believe in the tithe. You're this and you're that and you don't understand this and they start yelling at me. No. I'll be patient with you, and you can believe that, but you can't believe it and bring it in here and make a noise and cause trouble. You can't do that. That's all he's saying. They be patient with you. You be patient with them. And do I believe I understand the Bible better than these people that come in here and start trouble? Oh, yes. I believe I understand it a lot better. I wouldn't be standing up here preaching if I didn't think I understood it better than the sheep. That would be dumb, wouldn't it? If I thought somebody else understood it better than me, I'd say, I think you need to preach this Sunday. <coughs> How much time do I have? I didn't mean to go here, but I did. Now, let me show you one other thing. Go back to 1 Corinthians 8. 1 Corinthians 8. This is not talking about the same thing. 1 Corinthians 8. And, we're and I'm going to leave... Not fire attire, but the Jezebel thing when I get through this tonight. 1 Corinthians 8. All right. Let's start reading here in uh, verse 6. But to us there is but one God, the Father, and he's, he's telling people, well, I need to back up. If any, any, it, it back to verse 3. If any man love God, the same is known of him. As concerning, therefore, the eating of those things that are sacrificed unto idols, we know that an idol is nothing in the world. But he doesn't connect this eating things with idols. He doesn't connect it with fornication here. This is not the same thing. He's talking about Acts 15. And that Jezebel seduces them to eat things sacrificed to idols, commit fornication. There is none other God but one. And though there be that are called gods, whether in heaven or earth, 
as there be God's many and Lord's many, but to us, believers, there is but one God, the Father, of whom are all things, and we in him, and one Lord Jesus Christ, by whom are all things, and we by him. So he's saying, concerning things sacrificed to idols, this is talking about not the same thing as things sacrificed to idols and committing fornication, which had to do with going and worshiping idols. This has to do with them selling in the streets of Corinth. They would go over to one of these temple of Demeter. The pagans would take this meat, this sacrifice, offer it to an idol, and then take it out into the shambles, the little booths in the marketplace, and sell it. And Paul said, those are not gods. And if you go down and buy in the shambles of the marketplace meat that has been offered to Demeter, first of all, or Persephone, those are not goddesses. Those are not gods. All they did was cook it for you. That's all they did. He said, those are not gods. So he says, when you go out into the marketplace to buy that meat, Here's what he says about it. Verse 7. How be it? This is not every man. There is not in every man that knowledge. For some with conscience of the idol unto this hour eat it as a thing offered unto an idol. But Paul just got through saying those are not gods. They're just an oven. It's just an open fire to cook it in. And their conscience being weak is defiled. But meat commendeth us not to God, for neither if we eat are we the better, neither if we eat not are we the worst. But take heed, lest by any means this liberty of yours become a stumbling block, a proscoma, that word I put up on the board a while ago, P-R-O-S-K-O-M-M-A. Watch out what you do in front of others. That's, it means to apostatize. For if any man see thee which hath knowledge, sit at meat in the idol's temple, and they would actually serve it over there, as a, like a restaurant, shall not the conscience of him which is weak, if he sees you partaking of something. Some people say, well, it's not wrong to drink beer. The amount of alcohol content in Germany 150 years ago when everybody drank beer through the ages, as far as that itself, and even some of it they make today, but the point is, it is an appearance of evil. Abstain from appearances of evil. What would it look like? Go to a... Y'all see me out there preaching predestination. I got a beer in my hand. to Somebody at our picnic. That's, a, that's what he's saying. Anything that he says, not of the, he says, let me read verse 10. For if any man see thee which hath knowledge, you know that something's offered to idols. And the idol we offer to is self. And if it looks like something we're not supposed to be doing. I saw Billy Graham one time in the White House with uh, Ronald Reagan or Bill Clinton or one of those guys. I can't remember. Probably wasn't Bill Clinton, but Ronald Reagan or one of them. And Billy Graham was in the White House, and he had a long stem wine glass. And he turned to the camera, and I said, gotcha. Because that looked terrible on NBC News. That was a bad testimony. I don't care if it was water in the glass. It looked wrong. A long stem, big long one. He's going. And he's there with a bunch of heathens. And they all got their glasses, and you know they don't have water in it. For if any man see thee which hath knowledge sit at meat in the idol's temple, shall not the conscience of him which is weak be emboldened to do the same things you're doing? Watch out what you do in front of people. Those things which are offered to idols, and through thy knowledge shall the weak brother perish for whom Christ died. He's not talking about he'll perish in hell. His life will perish and his testimony be destroyed. And it'll take years for him to come out of it because you put your approval on what he's supposed to be, not supposed to be doing by your example. 
But when you sin so against the brethren, not against the sinner, but against the brethren, and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. Wherefore, if meat makes my brother to offend, scandalizo, causes him to apostatize and quit doing what he should do, I will eat no flesh, even though it is lawful for me, while the world standeth, lest I make my brother to offend. Whatever it is I do, and we have to examine our lives, and I examine myself. I didn't do this as a young believer. And if you look at 1 Corinthians 10, 23, all things are lawful for me. Paul is talking about all things that are lawful are lawful for me. He's not talking about robbing banks is lawful for me. All things, eating whatever I want to eat is lawful for me. But all things are not expedient. They're not profitable. Soon Pharaoh. They're not to my advantage. They're not to my profit. All things are lawful for me, but all things edify not. That word edify, oikodomeo, do not build up the house of God. Oikodomeo. Build up the house. Let no man seek his own, but every man another's. The word wealth is not there. Don't seek your own. Look not every man on his own things, but every man also on the things of others. Look out for your neighbor, your brother. Don't just be arrogant and say, I got the word together. I got all these Greek words. I'm going to beat you up with them. Whatever is sold in the shambles, the, me the makelon, M-A-K-E-L-L-O-N. The meat market. Whatever is sold in the meat market that has been offered over here to some idol... That eat, asking no question for conscience sake. Don't ask where it came from. Just eat it. So once you start questioning things and bring up questions unnecessary, it causes division. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof, and those are not God's. If any of them that believe not bid you to a feast, and you be deposed to go, or determined, ethleo is the word, Whatsoever is set before you, eat, asking no question, not bringing up, where did this come from? Because once you find out, and if there's a weak person there, that's why whenever I'm talking to somebody about truth, I never ask them what church they go to or how they were raised or what their denomination is. I never ask. Mary will tell you, never ask people. Where do you go to church? Don't want to know that because I built a wall up between me and them. Then if they say Church of Christ and I tell them baptism is not water, it's blood, they're going to say, aha, you're putting down my denomination. But if I don't know where they come from and they know I don't know, I don't ask any question. I just say, let me tell you the word baptized. Baptizo means to cover with a stain or die. And I go into communion and it's Passover. They'll keep their mouth shut, but they'll know I'm not attacking their church because I'm asking no questions for conscience sake. So I won't offend their conscience. Can you see that? Never ask somebody what church they go to. And don't ask them what they believe. Tell them the truth. It will overcome all their error. You understand that? Mary will tell you, I never ask people what church they go to or what they believe. Never. I start preaching truth to them. That way I don't have to climb over that wall of Baptist. That Baptist wall that builds up as soon as I say, what church you go? Oh, I go to the Baptist. Oh, me, here I go. Now I can't say nothing about baptism because they'll say I'm putting them down. But once I, once I start teaching them the truth, they'll know. I, I don't know where they go, what they do, what their beliefs are. And they'll know it's not personal. It's just business. <laughs> Let me read this and we'll quit. <clears throat> but if any man say unto you, this is offered in sacrifice unto idols, oops, you got the wrong information. Don't find out. Eat not for the sake that showed it, but for conscience sake. For the earth is the Lord's and the fullness thereof. Conscience, I say, not thine own, but of the other. For why is my liberty judged of another man's conscience? <clears throat> Never try to find out more than you need to know. Can you understand that? Never ask people what church they go to. Never. 
Never ask them what their beliefs are. Teach them the truth. For if by grace, if I by grace be a partaker, why am I evil spoken of? For that which I give thanks, whether therefore ye eat or drink, or whatsoever ye do, do all to the glory of God. Give none offense, give none scandal on. <coughs> Neither to the Jews, nor the Gentiles, nor the church of God. Even as I please all men in all things. He's not talking about I'm letting men have their way. He says, what I'm doing is I'm pleasing the church, but I'm not compromising the word of God. And that's what James is talking about in Acts 15. Not seeking mine own profit, but the profit of many that they may be saved. And boy, do we need to learn this? I didn't even mean to go here. I said I wasn't going to go there, and it's taken me all night to do this. And I haven't even covered it. That's it. It goes back to the hunters in the trap. That's right. Isn't that amazing? I didn't, I'm glad I did this because I've been meaning to give this to you for a long time. And I'm not by any means. I'll have to come back and teach through the 14th chapter of Romans and teach some through Romans. But I hope you'll see this. I wish people would understand that. God didn't send the believers here to beat up the baby sheep. And that's what believers do too often. Let's pray. Lord, thank you for truth, for your word. Thank you for opening up and revealing these things to us. Lord, it's so amazing how your word just ties from one book to the next. How you've just amalgamated all of this into a great tapestry. Thank you for your truth. Pray you'll cause us to continue this work. And Lord, you know where my heart is. I pray you'll give, give us doors of opportunity to preach this truth to the elect throughout of America. Give all of those here strength to Mary and Mike and all those that work with us on the mailing list and that help us get this message out. Give us strength and courage to continue this work. God, open many doors for the elect. Lord, we'll do it for your, your glory and your sake and not for, our, not for our glory. We ask these things in Christ's name. Amen.